In 1988, during the height of the craze for the Nintendo Entertainment System, Hasbro released three sets of PVC figure dioramas that depicted scenes from three of their most popular video games, Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, and Punch-Out! These small diorama scenes are described as being trophies, and the base of each figure had a scorecard sticker where you could write your name, the high score, and the date you achieved the score. Each figure stood approximately four inches tall. A replacement sticker also came in the box if you beat your own record. I believe that the idea behind these figures is that they were a reward for excelling at the game. Of course, games like The Legend of Zelda did not have a score or point system, so it really made no sense for these trophies. We'll start with trophies from Nintendo's most popular title, Super Mario Bros. <laughs> This is the game that featured the character who was, and still is, the mascot for the Nintendo game company, Mario. The trophies for the Super Mario Bros. game depicted six different scenes, and despite the name, only featured Mario, and not his brother Luigi. While six scenes were planned for all three of the games, Super Mario Bros. was the only game to get all six scenes, and Punch-Out! and The Legend of Zelda only received five. The trophies came in a box with a plastic display window in the front and a picture of all six of the different Super Mario Bros. game scenes on the back. The trophies are from the early days of the 8-bit Nintendo system, and Mario looks a bit different from his modern depictions. We'll start with a scene titled, Mario Runs from Bullet Bill. This trophy depicts Mario running from an encroaching Bullet Bill enemy from the game. In the game, the Bullet Bill is usually shown as black in color but here is depicted in yellow for some reason. The Super Mario Bros. manual describes the Bullet Bill as chasing Mario slowly and steadily. In actuality, it was really more of a projectile that moved straight forward without changing trajectory. The next trophy is titled Mario Stomps the Goombas. Mario is suspended in the air above the doomed Goombas who seem to be screaming in terror. Man, this is a little more violent than the scene needs to be. The Goomba was the weakest enemy in the Super Mario Bros. game, and usually the first to fall prey to Mario's famous stomp attack. The manual describes them as mushrooms that betrayed the Mushroom Kingdom, but no one ever questions why they betrayed the Mushroom Kingdom. That's just something to think about. This trophy is titled, The Blooper Chases Mario. It shows Mario with a look of shock and horror as he realizes that a blooper is coming up quickly from behind. But don't worry too much about Mario, he seems to have a star man, now known as a power star, in his hand that gives him limited invincibility. The blooper was a squid-like enemy that was found in the underwater and swimming stages of the Super Mario Bros. game. These stages could be particularly frustrating as the enemies could come at you from all different directions. And this trophy is titled, Super Mario Hurls a Fireball. They wanted to be sure to let you know that it was no ordinary Mario, but Super Mario that was throwing a fireball. You know, everybody loves the fireball power-up, and this power has been depicted several times, even in modern iterations. In the game, when Mario grabs a fire flower, his color scheme changes to red and white, and he is able to hurl small, bouncing fireballs at the enemies. Uh, one such enemy is the turtle enemy called the Hammer Brother, as seen here, which lobbed endless supplies of hammers at Mario and Luigi. And speaking of Hammer Brothers, this trophy is titled Mario Kicks One of the Hammer Brothers. While this scene did not and could not happen in the game, it is easily one of the most awesome scenes anyone has ever seen Mario involved in. Damn! And the last of the Super Mario Bros. trophies is Bowser Guards Princess Toadstool. Mario is nowhere to be seen in this trophy, and Bowser looks really different than he does in modern depictions. This is just a spectacularly strange bit of vintage Mario merchandise. Of course, Princess Toadstool would later be called Peach, and the in-game depiction of Bowser was also pretty different from the modern depictions. Nonetheless, at the end of each world, Mario would face off with Bowser and either defeat him with fireballs or grab the axe and cut the bridge out from underneath him. Uh, Peach herself only showed up at the end of the game. 
next set of trophies is from the popular Legend of Zelda game that featured an elfin hero named Link who wandered the land of Hyrule in an attempt to find the parts of the legendary Triforce artifact and save the Princess Zelda who was held captive by the evil Ganon. Each trophy figure depicts Link fighting various enemies from the game, and each with a dungeon or ruin background behind them. They came in boxes that were nearly identical to the Super Mario Bros. trophies, and the back of the box showed what was supposed to be six scenes depicted on each trophy. While there are six scenes shown, the general consensus is that the Link Battle Zola trophy was never produced or offered for purchase. The first trophy in the Legend of Zelda line is titled Gibdo Attacks Link. Here Link brandishes a sword and shield, his primary weapons of choice, against the undead enemy called a Gibdo. The Gibdo was a mummy enemy that was located in the dungeons where Link could find a piece of the Triforce artifact. While the manual says that he has some strange powers, he really just walked around and ran into Link to do damage. It really didn't qualify as strange or even a power. The next trophy is titled, A Keys Descends on Link. Here, the hero Link is depicted shooting a bow at the bat-like Keys enemy that attacks from above him. The Keys enemy was a bat-like monster that fluttered around the dungeons, usually in large numbers. Their erratic movements made them difficult to deal with, especially when en masse. This trophy is titled, Link Boomerang Zagoma. I actually didn't know that boomerang could be a verb. You learn new things all the time. Here, Link is throwing a boomerang at an enemy called a goma while on a ladder. And as all video game enthusiasts know, being on a ladder is an inconvenient place to be attacked. And the goma was a large crustacean or arachnid that served as a boss or a sub-boss in several of the dungeons in the game. It had a single giant eye in the middle of its body and I bet you can't guess where the weak spot was. Interestingly, the eye had to be pierced by an arrow to kill this enemy, and the boomerang was nearly useless against it. And this trophy is titled, Link Fights the Head of a Gleok. This is an action-packed scene that shows Link grabbing the head of a Gleok dragon, who is in the process of breathing fire, to deliver the finishing blow with his sword. This is the Mario Kicks a Hammer Brother kick slow motion scene that we all saw in our minds when we were playing that 8-bit game. The Gleok was a multi-headed dragon that served as both boss and sub-boss in several of the dungeons that contained a piece of the Triforce. You had to cut off all of its heads, but until you did, each of the severed heads would continue to fly around the room and shoot fireballs at Link. It was great, at least it was in the players' minds. And the last Legend of Zelda trophy is called A Trap Attacks Link. This trophy sported the largest and most detailed Link figure but really was the scene with the least amount of action to be depicted on it. I couldn't find a good picture of the trap, but it's really supposed to be a mechanical device that moved quickly at Link as he walked into a room or into a specific area. They could not be destroyed and you had to dodge them. Here's the description from the manual. Next we have the trophies from the game Punch-Out. Punch-Out was a boxing game in which the player controlled the boxer called Little Mac as he fought his way through multiple boxers from different countries in his attempt to become the best boxer in the world. Depictions of the various boxers were always very culturally sensitive and well researched. And just kidding, it was the 80s people. The game was still a lot of fun. The box was very similar to the other trophy boxes for The Legend of Zelda and the Super Mario Bros. games with a large plastic display window in the front and depictions of the different trophies available on the back. And like the Legend of Zelda trophies, one of the figures, the trophy with the character Don Flamingo, appears to have never been produced. The first trophy is titled Mac Jabs Glass Joe. It depicts Mac delivering a quick jab punch to old Glass Joe's noggin. Glass Joe was the first boxer you faced in the game, and the easiest. He had a glass jaw and could be dispatched with a few good punches to the face. The next trophy is called Mac Levels King Hippo. It shows Mac standing victorious after defeating the opponent known as King Hippo. Is it just me or does Mac look like Tony Danza here? 
Now, uh, maybe that was deliberate. Yeah, who's the boss now, Hippo? King Hippo was one of the best fights in the game, and the match that taught you to look for an opponent's weakness to achieve victory. King Hippo's weakness was a stomach, as evidenced by the crossed bandages, and a series of one-two punches to the gut could put him down for good. This trophy is titled Mac KO's Piston Honda. For those not up with the lingo, KO stands for knockout, and Piston Honda was a fighter from Japan. Yup, anyway. Here's Piston Honda in the game. You would have to face this guy twice before winning the game. The first time was early on when he was pretty easy, but the second time was much closer to the end and his difficulty was dialed way up. Honda was obviously putting in the practice time. This trophy is called Mac Catches the Tiger Punch. It depicts little Mac fighting the boxer called the Great Tiger from India. I should point out that each of the backgrounds for the Punch-Out trophies is an audience scene. The Great Tiger had a move called the Magic Punch, in which he disappeared and would quickly reappear multiple times in front of Mac with a barrage of punches. If you timed your punches just right, you might be able to knock him out of a spell and get a quick KO. And note that the referee is Mario. You know, that guy could do anything. This statue is titled Bald Bull and Mac Mix It Up. Little Mac is shown fighting the boxer called the Bald Bull. It looks like Mac is getting a shot into the gut. Probably during the Bald Bull's infamous Bull Charge move. The Bald Bull was one of the larger characters in the game and one of the first really large characters that Mac had to face. His blows were far more powerful than Mac's but he also had some pretty obvious signals telling you when he was going to throw a punch. He also had a really annoying laugh if he beat you. <laughs> and this last trophy is titled Mac Brawls with Super Macho Man. Since Macho Man is looking away in this figure, it is really hard to find a picture of his face. Mac has to really reach to get to his face. Seems like Mac was about as big as a six-year-old or something. Super Macho Man was originally the final opponent that Mac would face in his Rise of World Champion, but Nintendo for a while would add one even more powerful competitor, the heavyweight champion and 80s icon, Iron Mike Tyson. He does. He does. Now, you're playing with power. These trophy figures are some of the greatest examples of the merchandise available in the early days of the World of Nintendo marketing campaign. A campaign that saw Nintendo characters on all different types of merchandise, and before certain stylistic elements were really hammered out and standardized. They also offered some of the most action-packed versions of video game scenes that could have only happened in our imaginations, due to the limitations of the hardware at the time. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of The Little Things. I hope you enjoyed this look at some Nintendo and video game memorabilia and treasures from the past. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to stay in touch with future content. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join us again to remember the little things that made video gaming culture so much fun during the 1980s.